we are really, really delighted to, uh, to have you and uh, uh, to have you with us. And uh, you've written a whole entire book about the Akedah. We are about to celebrate Rosh Hashanah. We're in the middle of the days of Slichot now. And I can't think of a more relevant time when, we're, when the Akedah comes up. We're soon going to be saying Slichot, which draw on the Akedah as a source of divine mercy. And in fact, on Rosh Hashanah itself, we're going to evoke Bishut um, Hatam Yotzi Ayom Batzedek Dineinu, um, the idea that calling on the near martyrdom of, of, of Yitzchak, and we're going to talk about Zocher Habrit, Akedat Yitzchak Lezaro Barachamim Tiskor, that the Akeda should be remembered to the seed, to the, to the progeny of Abraham and Yitzchak. Um, so this is a time of year where we're really recalling the Akedah as a very, very powerful, evocative uh, text. And yet, Dr. Kola, I read your, I, I, I watched your, the trailer for your, for your book. I also read the book. <laughs> 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 but I watched the trailer. And you know, you always know the movie, you know, the movie isn't quite the book. <laughs> but um, the way you, you, the, you, you sort of like raised a really troubling uh, side of this, of the Arcada, where you said, uh, you, you, you spoke about people like uh, Baruch Goldstein, who massacred people in the name of, massacred Muslims in the name of the Jewish religion. And of course, uh, we are a few days after 9-11. Uh, we, we don't need too many reminders about how religion can sometimes be used to, um, to stimulate violence and, uh, you know, in the name of God. So here we have like a bit of a clash, which I think you've thrown into the mix, which is on the one hand, our liturgy and our tradition seeks uh, look at lords the arcade as this great moment for which we should be given mercy for all time and yet you talk about this as a very very dangerous text so i know this is a bit of a provocative question but i thought i'd start off with a provocative one and then i'll let you unveil your theory later on <laughs> but i'm going to start off with the, with the with the provocation and see where we can go from there that that seems fair um well it's great to it's great to be here it's great to talk to you alex uh, so I'll say it like this, the Akedah <clears throat> has meant many different things. Let's focus on Jewish uh, reception of it. I think that's, that's fair for our purposes. <clears throat> sort of as an intellectual historian, it's interesting obviously to see how it went to different people as well. But um, when we talk about what it's meant to Jews over the last couple of thousand years, and we have more than 2,000 years of, of documented interpretation of the Akedah. We have, you know, there's a, a bunch of uh, Dead Sea Scrolls that talk about it, huge amounts in Chazal uh, about the Akedah, uh, and then of course, you know, all sorts of genres from that point on. So it's meant a lot of different things, and I have uh, certainly no, no quibble with the idea that it means, among other things, uh, that it's testimony to the breach between Hashem and Abraham and the zechut that, uh, that it stands for, for Zarosh al-Abraham, for future generations. I think that's, that's almost papering over the problem, though. Uh, in other words, you can say that, and I would you know, happily sign on to that. And yet, we haven't really talked about, like, well, why? Like, what, what is so remarkable about the story? What, what makes it such a, an important story that it's, indicates the brief. Uh, there's, you know, the, the 11, 12 prakim of the stories of Abraham. Uh, a number of them can be taken as indicative of, reflective of this breed. Uh, and so what makes the Akedah so central in thinking about it? Well, you know, most of the time that we invoke it, we don't get into the details. And that's, you know, I think, uh, I don't mean that critically, I think that's entirely reasonable, but I think it's also an important observation that we can say things without having to think too hard about them and say, like, oh, the Akedah should stand for us, you know, Zchut Avot, Zchut Abraham, Zchut Yitzchak, Me'akadol Gabay Amizbeach, and we can sort of leave it at that. And that, I think, again, is not an unreasonable thing to do for lots of purposes. Uh, what started troubling me is, um, yeah, so my first year in graduate school was, uh, it was 2001. Uh, we had actually spent the previous year in Israel as well. So um, Shira and I had gotten married. We spent the year in Israel. 
in 2000, 2001. That was a rough year in Israel, as you probably recall. That was the year we were actually in Alon Shvut. And um, if I remember correctly, Motzei Rosh Hashanah, you know, someone gave a clap on the bima and said something like, uh, Don't the road too closed sure. also, you might want to get your neshek from the machsan. <laughs> and uh, we'll talk more in an hour or so. Uh, before WhatsApp, of course. So this is, you know, rapid communication was claps on the bima. Um, and Shira was studying in, uh, in Bruria uh, at the time. So like her, her trips were adventures. And then we came to New York the following year and I was actually traveling to Philadelphia for school. And, you know, two weeks in, I was in Penn and we got uh, these like very confused the first reports of the uh, World Trade Center. So yeah, so this, these, these, uh, the idea of religion being used violently is certainly something that's, I think, unavoidably been on mine and lots of other people's minds uh, over the last 20 years. And, and as you said, you know, I think it's only fair to say that the Jew Jews have not been exempt from this uh, either. Um, Baruch Goldstein went to Flatbush, as did I. Um, and uh, I actually remember uh, I was in Flatbush in 1994 in high school and uh, one of the uh, senior teachers you know, came in to, to say something and he said, Zohar Goldstein, we are Shav Sham. Oh, wow. Like, oh boy. That was, uh, it was pretty terrible. So, so I think, you know, I think it's, it's almost unavoidable to think about religious violence in today's day and age. It's not a new phenomenon, but it certainly looms large today. And at some point, I was teaching the Akeda in a couple of uh, different settings, <clears throat> and, it, and I sort of dawned on, dawned on me that philosophically speaking, not necessarily sociologically, but philosophically speaking, there is a reading of the Akeda that leads or leaves very little room between the portrait that some people point to, paint of Avraham and someone who's willing to pick up a gun and, and mow people down in a mosque. And that reading of the Akedah is what really terrified me. It's not the Akedah in and of itself, but one way that people have read it is that this is a great story because here you have someone who's willing to put aside everything that he knows otherwise is right and good about the world. And that includes all of ethics, all of love, all of his human relationships, all of his obligations towards other human beings. And he says, I got to put that aside because my faith calls me to do something. And that is a line that you can imagine a lot of people saying in really hor horrifically terrifying circumstances. I know what I'm about to do is wrong. I know it violates everything I know ethically and relationally and in terms of my uh, obligations to other human beings, but what can I do? Faith. Um, so, so it's really that reading that, um, it really did scare me. I was, you know, I was actually thinking like, well, you know, do we actually have this in our tradition? Like, is this something that, you know, if someone says to me like, well, I unfortunately have to behead this infidel in the desert. I just have no choice. It's what faith calls me to do. Do I, as a Jew loyal to the tradition, actually have no response to that other than to say like, well, you know, I, I think you're probably wrong, but like, I agree with you that in principle that is possible. That sounded like a, like a really scary, scary place to be in. So that was the, the start of the idea of actually writing something about the Akeda. It's not that I have a problem with the Akeda, but I do have a problem with one way that people have read it. And so the book is not you know, pro or con the Akeda itself. It is arguing against one way of reading the Akeda and in favor of a different way of reading the Akeda. Right. I, look, I, I assume that uh, Jews have not been so susceptible to using the Akeda in this way. In fact, I imagine when we evoke this in our tefillah and in our slichot, um, I think many of these texts were written at times when Jews were the object uh, of martyrdom or, or, or actually had to martyr themselves in the sense yeah. that, you know, whether it was in the first crusades or what have you, that a lot of these Ashkenazi piyutim are essentially saying, uh, we were the Abraham and we were the Isaac in the sense that there was no conflict between ethics and religion. Uh, it meant the same thing. They were basically told to give up everything they believed in um, or to face death. And they decided as a matter of faith to face right. death because that was their entire world of meaning. Right, that's definitely true. So actually one of the, one of the arguments in the book that I, that I make is that this whole reading of the Akedah as uh, submitting uh, or you know, suspending ethics for faith is entirely a modern reading and that no one, like not Jews, not Christians, like no one was reading the story as, uh, as meaning that until about 200 years ago. Um, and I, you know, I, I, 
now that that's a matter of history, uh, which I think is right. You know, I'm uh, waiting for someone to to show me like you know actually here's a text from 800 years ago that says exactly the same thing, but but I think that's right historically. Um, the more judgmental sort of um, opinionated part of that is that I also think that it's a wrong turn in reading the story. And there's a a new a new interpretation from 200 years ago could be where we finally have discovered something profoundly true about the story. Uh, and my argument in the book, this is actually a new reading that took the story to really bad places that it, it never was before. And you know, to a large extent, I'm trying to argue that actually Jews were doing a lot better before they got uh, this, this sort of modern view in their <laughs> well, head. Let's, so let's talk about the, this, this development that you, that you discuss in the book. Actually, Should we get back to the Crusades though? Because I would actually love to, I mean, I, it's terrible, but um, and we could do it later if you'd like. Well, but, go, go for it. Go for it. So if it's okay, yeah, thank you. I, the because um, I, I think what you're what you're drawing attention to is really crucially important. Like a lot of my book deals with a sort of philosophical approaches to the Akedah. Okay, like you know, a philosopher gets his hands on the story and thinks like, okay, what is the story about? So that could be a philosopher like Kierkegaard two hundred years ago, but it could also be a philosopher like the Rambam. Uh, who is you know, approaching the story as a philosopher. And he says, well, what does the story teach us? And you know, well, there's the following lessons that it teaches us, you know, about prophecy and about Ahavat Hashem, and that's all great. But the vast majority of Jews, and this gets back to your first question also, the vast majority of Jews, uh, whether or not they were philosophically inclined, didn't look at the story philosophically. And I think it's important to say that when we invoke the story, we're not invoking it as philosophers. We're invoking it, I think, viscerally as a story of immense power, even if we can't quite put into words what that power is. And I think that's one of the points of stories in general. I mean, the reason we tell, the reason the Torah has story, uh, this is an old question, right? Sadi Gohan asks it in the beginning of his Perush uh, Torah, but like, why are there stories? Well, one part of the answer has to be that stories can do things that sort of discursive philosophy can't. Like I can tell you truths, but sometimes stories can do things, first of all, convey those truths more, um, more in three dimensions, but more importantly, they can do things that aren't just reducible to a series of propositions. Right. They can talk about humanity and human life and a relationship in a way that I'll never be able to just paraphrase in like a set of bullet points um, if I tried to articulate it that way. So I think it's really important to say that the Akeda looms largest not really as a philosophical treatise, but as a really astonishing narrative of, I say, a father who's also, of course, a uh, a person of faith, uh, and his son, who, in many readings, and I think uh, the majority of traditional Jewish readings, is a full partner in that in that faith and in that covenantal relationship with with Hashem. So the Crusades are actually really remarkable because. I mean, they're terrible. They really are terrible to read. Like, we have these Crusade Chronicles from uh, from right after the First Crusade, you know, within a couple of decades. Uh, and the First Crusade has this, you know, this uh, like horrific phenomenon where you know, the Christians on their way to reconquer the Holy Land from the Muslims, you know, some of them, uh, especially certain circles, uh, decided like sort of no say Kavachomer Latzman and said, well, you know, if we're going to travel a, a thousand miles to uh, to conquer the infidels over there in the Middle East, like we should probably do something about the infidels here in our midst on their way. So this is like a fringe view at the time, but it was, you know, uh, prominent enough that many, many Jews suffered for it, many meaning in the thousands. Um, and then we have these stories in the Chronicles where parents would actually not only submit themselves to death, rather than be captured by the Christians, but in some cases actually kill their children rather than allow them to be captured by the Christians. And, you know, historians today have talked about this a lot. Historians of halakha have asked, you know, was this an Ashkenazic halakhic tradition? Why did anyone think this is okay? Like, you know, suicide is like at best questionable if it's not a chiyuv. Right, many have, uh, many have charted the way that this really changed the entire halakhic a view of suicide. Yeah, right. But murder, you know, there's there's really very little to go on uh, to justify murder, um, essentially to avoid being, uh, you know, a, a child being captured. Like again, Yerig Val Yavor is sort of machloket rishonim whether that can be done optionally or not. But but murder is is uh, is hard to justify. So, but putting the halachic question aside, 
the the question like the the chronicles themselves very much cast this as an akedah and they do that by using words like ma'achelet so like the father will pick up a ma'achelet the shchotet beno and you're like okay you know this is obviously meant to allude to it and then it also gives a vocabulary for some of the chroniclers theological outrage um you know there's like a really fascinating part in one of the chronicles where it says look look the angel intervened to stop the Akeda on Haramoria, which I think is fascinating because it's not clear that the angel intervenes to stop this travesty. Like, you know, I think we take it as like, oh, Hashem never meant it to go, to go all the way. But the Chronicles are like, no, no, you know, at this point, the angel intervened and said like, oh, this can't happen. And then the Chronicles are like, well, how, how, how come the angels are silent now as 1100 Akedot are taking part, place on the same day? Um, so you know, this, this happens to be a really heart-wrenching example. But the key point really is that the Akeda has, has really meant more as, a, uh, as an emotional story of faith and devotion rather than a philosophical treatise of some teaching that we're supposed to, uh, to learn from it over the course of Jewish history. And that's something that I think, um, you know, when we talk about the, the use in Tefillah and Rosh Hashanah, and, you know, um, I, every day conceivably also, but certainly on Rosh Hashanah, I think we're probably making a mistake if you like pause every time you get to that line in Zichronot and say like, okay, do I hold like Kierkegaard or do I hold like Levinas here? Like what exactly is the meaning of the Akedah? What am I saying here in this bracha? Like that's probably not what the, what Chazal had in mind uh, when we talk about uh, calling the Akedah to, to Hashem's mind. More of like uh, a, a powerful, but maybe best un, un, uh, unphilosophized story uh, that sort of looms very large in our collective memory. Um, okay, so we've spoken a little bit about the traditional layer, um, but you you have said uh, to us just now, and you write in your book that about a couple of hundred years ago there was a shift. I don't know if you're the first person to have like put in the same um, sort of in the same basket: uh, Kierkegaard, Hasidut, the Chassam Sofer, and the and uh, the Malbim, I, I, I thought that was a really yeah. interesting group uh, to put together um, as reflective of a shift in mindset, which you, which you uh, see as happening, a shift from collectivism to a more individual identity, um, a sort of a crumbling of uh, assumed identities. And a, a, but can you tell us a little more about what you see as this shift? Kierkegaard is the person who articulated it, in the wider philosophical realm. And then you talk about how this is, we'll go to the stage of how it was adopted uh, by Soloveitchik and uh, by Leibowitz later. But sure. what, what's happening, which you feel creates this sort of, you know, you're, you're describing it almost as being sort of inherent and instinctive in Jews in the medieval times and in our liturgy. So what is this uh, sort of development of the Arcada as a sort of fundamental ethical text. What, what happens there 200 years ago? Right. So, yeah, so that's exactly right. And, and so maybe let's start with the broad thing and then I'll, I'll, I'll say how I think it affects the Akeda. Um, I, I can't imagine actually that I am the first person to say this because this is very far from stuff that I actually know well. <laughs> so I for sure picked this up from somewhere, but I couldn't find it. And I asked, uh, you know, I asked some colleagues for, for references and yeah, I was like, oh yeah, that, no, it seems right, but like, I, I, I don't know. So I, I can't imagine that uh, that's my insight, but it, um, but uh, I, I can't find someone who's who articulated it quite this way, or maybe not in terms of biblical interpretation either. The broad point is um, that European Jewry, in particular, in you know about the age of the Enlightenment, so late 18th, early 19th century, went through some massive upheavals, and you know you can trace this in detail in certain countries and. You know, I think we know, um, you know, in Napoleonic France, the idea that Jews will get uh, all rights as human beings, but no rights as Jews, right? So that doesn't mean that they don't have rights to be Jews. It means that as a corporate identity, the Jews are defunct. Like there's no more state within a state, like the Jewish community, right? The Kila, um, which existed throughout the Middle Ages, where like, you know, the, the ruling power would say, okay, Jewish kihila, like you owe us, you know, 10,000 gold ducats of, uh, for taxes or whatever. And the kihila has to figure out how to like get it from the individuals. But they have like a sort of semi-autonomous organization within themselves. I'm not so interested in the economic or social histories of that. What I am interested in is, is the sense that that provided 
uh, an identity for Jews as part of a corporate group. Like I'm a Jew in part because of what I believe in, in part because of the mitzvot that I do, in part because of what I eat and so on, but in part because I'm part of this group. Like that's part of my identity is, is being uh, actually part of this group that it, like, even if no one ever interrogates my emunot deot or checks, you know, whether my kitchen's kosher, I, I'm obviously Jewish. Like that's just the life that I live. And over the course of that, you know, half century or so uh, around the year 1800, uh, Europe sort of takes apart these corporate groups within itself, and everyone becomes citizens of the state. So this is this is good in the sense that like you know no one's a uh, no one's discriminated against at least in theory no one's discriminated against uh, every, everyone now has equal rights protection under the law and so on and so forth. But what it does is it means that from now on religion actually is almost entirely within yourself. So now my identity as a Jew um, depends on actually what I, how I, like what I do, what I believe, what I think, because no one's forcing me to be a Jew because I live in the ghetto or I live in the shtetl. Like I, I, I now am a citizen of France. I live in Paris. You know, maybe my next door neighbors are Jews still, maybe they're not. But legally speaking, my Jewish identity is just dependent on what I want to do as a Jew. So Kierkegaard, uh, I think is, as you said, sort of like most explicitly attuned to this. Like he's the one who says, who writes just a lot about this. Um, and so he, he's really troubled, obviously not as a Jew, because he's a Danish Lutheran, but he, um, he's really troubled by what it means to be a Christian now. So a Christian, he s seems to think, used to mean like something about my soul. Like, do I believe? Have I, have I adopted uh, this particular belief into my belief system? I'm sorry. Uh, used to, right, uh, and you look at the old saints, but now, like, you're telling me, like, I'm a Christian, like, I'm just part of the country, so I'm a, I'm a Christian by virtue of being a, by being a citizen of Denmark. If I don't identify as a Jew, then I must be a Christian. And he's like, well, no, 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 but it's got to be inside me. It's got to be, like, something inside my soul, and for a Jew, of course, it's even more oppressing, because you can't be a Jew by virtue of being a citizen of Denmark or of, of France, uh, these are primarily Christian countries. So if you want to be a Jew, you really have to identify as a Jew. So this is the, like the, the people that you listed earlier, you know, they all have what I think is a, a turn inward. Like suddenly what matters most is like what's in your heart, what's in your soul. And that's true for someone like, um, so you think about the early Hasidim, right? So Hasidu grows up at this time and that's, that's only a turn inward. Um, it turns to like the emotional state of the human being. But it's also true about someone as different from, the Hasidim as the Gra, who's also like, yeah, you know, I'm not a communal rub anymore. I sit in a Beit Midrash and I just study all day. And this sort of like entirely internal religion uh, is also a function of this turn inward. And you also find that in the world of ethics, you find, you know, Kant coming along with his categorical imperative and, you know, saying the ultimate moral voice is me, right? You know, it's, it's the point. It's, That's a great point. And I, the truth is, I've been told that John Wesley uh, and Wesleyanism uh, which, you know, roughly a contemporary also, uh, could be seen as, as sort of parallel to Hasidut in this way, like also a sense, uh, turn inward and a sense of, uh, well, a lot of parallels in, in their emphases. So, but I think, you know, the way you said it, I think is right. Like this is, this is not so much uh, an idea that someone had that then became an important idea as much as like the world had changed, the whole world had changed, and that then led to people sort of inevitably thinking about religion in different ways. So people who disagree about everything. So yeah, the, so about the Akeda, right? The Akeda. Yeah, so about the Akeda. So, so Kierkegaard's the one who does this most explicitly. And Kierkegaard says, ah, so okay, now that I have to worry about my own personal religion and finding room for my own personal religion in this like very big complicated world of uh, universal ethics and sort of like big theories like Kant, you know, he's, he's very, uh, troubled by Kant, because um, Kant has no room for the individual. Kant's like, you know, we're going to figure, we're going to think purely, and we're going to figure out the truth about the world. Uh, and at the same time, you have Hegel, who's like, you know how history works? It has nothing to do with what, like, Alex in Jerusalem uh, does, or what Aaron in New York does. People are just cogs in the wheels. Like, history is like big movements. There's always like, uh, something happens, and then something happens back, and then there's a synthesis. Um, and Kierkegaard's like, I don't understand, like, where's the person in all this? Like, where's me? Like, I am a person, and I want to know where I fit into all this. So he looks at the Akedah, and he says, this is a story about this tension. 
This is a story that actually, you know, a long time ago, captures this tension between the universal ethics and the individual. An individual is where you find faith. So Abraham is caught between his obligations to his son, his obligations to his wife, his obligations to all the rest of humanity. Those are universal, generalizable principles that, of course, he's a good person. That goes without saying. But he's caught between that on the one hand and his radically personal faith on the other. And by radically personal, Kierkegaard means like he can't talk about it. His faith in God is entirely between him and God. He could probably say words like, I believe in God, or I have a relationship with God, but no one could possibly understand what that would mean. So here's where Avraham, the individual, clashes with Avraham, the citizen. And, and, he's actually, and he's actually saying that in a certain way, then, he's actually establishing this idea that by all means, the Arcadia is, if I want to put it, unethical. Unethical, but that he heard a divine voice, he feels it in his heart, and therefore he it's okay for him to go ahead with it. Yeah, exactly right. So by ethical, I mean, I should just you know, clarify that ethical means like universal principles of ethics. So, right. um, so someone who does something like, if I do something that's unethical, um, if I cheat on my taxes in order to have more money, that is unethical, but I haven't left the realm of ethics. I might be arguing that like, you know, my having more money uh, is better than the government having more money in its coffers. So, so my argument, I can still tell you my argument. So for Kierkegaard, that's not outside of the realm of ethics. It's not, it's not like, are you right or wrong in an ethical argument? The key with Avram is that he's entirely left the realm of ethics altogether. He just has no argument anymore. And actually a really important part of, of his, I think a philosophically important part of his book uh, says like, well, you know, there are a lot of people who have been willing to sacrifice their children. Like, I mean, unfortunately, uh, we just talked about people in the Crusades, but he's like, look, I, I know from classical literature, you know, in, in one version of the, uh, of the story of the Battle of Troy, uh, Agamemnon has to sacrifice his daughter Iphigenia in order to assuage the gods that there'll be the correct winds that they can get their ships over to Troy and they can finally fight against Troy. And he actually is willing to sacrifice his daughter in order to do this. Uh, or Yiftach, who is prepared to, apparently does, sacrifice his daughter when he comes back from war because he made a nether. Right? So Kierkegaard's like, so what, what's the difference between Avraham and Yiftach or Agamemnon? All, they're all willing to sacrifice their children. And his argument is that Agamemnon and Yiftach can articulate to you why they're doing it. They actually think they're doing the ethically right thing to do. Yiftach would say, well, I made a nether. I, you know, we have, we, meaning Chazal and, uh, you know, all other readers might be like, there's ways out of this, but, but Yiftach would say, like I'm in a nether, like I, I'm obligated to keep my vow. So it's the ethical thing to do to sacrifice my daughter. But if you stopped Avram and said, why are you doing this? He would have to say something like, I can't talk about it. If you want to arrest me, you have to, you'll arrest me. But like, I can't, I can't offer a defense because so all I, I could have to say is like faith and that's not going to mean anything to anyone else. So I, 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 I have to say that I've always, uh, I know that this is called the suspension of the ethical or sometimes people talk about a leap of faith, um, a certain absurdity here. But I've, I, I, so me personally, I've never found it so attractive. It seems a bit absurd to me. Um, and what you say in your book is that uh, thinkers who are really celebrated thinkers uh, like Yishayahu Leibovich and uh, Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik championed this view of uh, Kierkegaard a hundred years after his time and celebrated Avraham, the knight of faith, um, in his suspension of the ethical. What's the attraction? Why did they, what were they trying to achieve by, what was it about their time, maybe the, the 20th century that led them to feel that this was the need of the hour, to have a, a Judaism that was based in the, should we call it the irrational or the, um, the absurd? And uh, why do they sort of draw so heavily on Kierkegaard's thinking? Great. So there's, I, I guess, um, two complementary answers to that. One is uh, sort of biographical, intellectual, historical. So, so both of the thinkers that you, that you mentioned um, grow up in philosophical circles. Just to yes, be you mentioned. No, I, I I'm mentioning them because Dr. Kola mentioned them in his book. <laughs> no, no. <I'm> <laughs> Um, so they grew up in philosophical circles in Germany in the 20s, where Kierkegaard is on everyone's reading table, everyone's reading him. 
um, for reasons that are, are parallel to, but not exactly the same as why uh, Rabbi Soloveitchik and Professor Leibovich are interested in him. So, so they're like, first of all, they just, they, they, are, they know him well, like they, they literally grew up with him intellectually. In terms of their own attraction, um, besides whatever else is in the air, so I think it's important to, to, to just realize that these are two orthodox thinkers. So Kierkegaard gets a diverse range of reactions from Jewish thinkers in the 20th century. Um, and it does cut across, across uh, denominations to some extent, but it's also like lines up with denominations to some extent. So, you know, on, uh, on the one hand, you might have someone like Milton Steinberg, a you know, very prominent reform rabbi in the, in the 40s, uh, author of As a Driven Leaf, um, who writes a little essay called, I think, Kierkegaard in Judaism, where he says, it is absolutely anathema to think that God would ever ask someone to suspend ethics. On the contrary, God is nothing, I shouldn't say nothing but ethics, that's not what he says either, uh, but God would never uh, go against ethics or ask anyone else to go against ethics. And you can hear like, oh, that's, that's again, I don't wanna trivialize it, but like, it's not surprising to hear a reform rabbi saying, that religion is fa founded on an ethical foundation. Like that's, that's a, sort of a non-negotiable part of it. On the other hand, so uh, Rabbi Soloveitch and, and Professor Leibovitch, um, they're actually looking for, I think, you know, consciously or, or subconsciously, but they're actually looking for a way of navigating religion in a world where it's no longer clear that religion is actually making you a good person. And this you know, goes back to your, your comment from uh, a little while ago. Pre-modern people, it's not that they had all the answers, right? Like Amalek has troubled everyone forever and the Shiva Amalek has troubled everyone forever. But they were, the question came from a place of, well, religion is basically moral. Religion certainly doesn't conflict with morality. Religion makes us good people. And so we really don't get this part of it. Like we don't, we don't understand how like Amalek could be commanded. Like how could we have this sivoy to, to wipe out, you know, men, women, and children? or irony dacha, which some of the Rishonim point out is like morally troubling, like what do the kids do? Um, so those are good questions. And again, it's not that people had the answers, but the, they were asked on the basis of an assumption that like religion and morality are walking together. Like they're both working to make people good people. That doesn't mean that religion is nothing but morality, but there's certainly an assumption that religion and like basic goodness were on the same team uh, in, in sort of like world history. And in modern times, that's become a, a less obvious assumption. Leibovitch is the most extreme person who just denies it. It's not true. Religion and goodness have nothing to do with each other. There may sometimes be like accidental coincidences where religion says something, like specifically halakha says things, and uh, that happens to also be the good thing to do, but it's an accident. Like if you do it because it's a good thing to do, you're not actually a religious person. And you know, he, being uh, the sharp tongue that he was, uh, even says things like, if you, if you do things that are in fact mitzvot, but you do them because you're convinced that it's the good moral thing to do, not only are you not a religious person, you're actually an Oveda Vodazara, because all you're really doing is worshiping the moral intuition within the human being. You're not really worshiping God at all. So he looks at the Akedah, and he especially looks at Kierkegaard's reading of the Akedah, and he's like, Here's the story that proves it. Uh, if it's okay, I'm actually gonna, maybe I'll, I'll spend a little bit more time on Leibovitch and Soloveitchik because Leibovitch is so clear about it and Rabbi Soloveitchik is actually like a lot more complex in his uh, presentation. So Leibovitch has this amazing reading, which I say amazing, but like also terrifying. Uh, he, says, um, uh, he says, look, Avram, you know, a few prakim ago, argued with God about Sodom or at least a dialogue with God about Sodom, right? God said, I'm gonna go check out Sodom. And Abraham said, well, let's talk about the rules here. Because I should wait call the Aras, lo yasem mishpat, right? You gotta make sure to do tzedek and mishpat. So, you know, a lot of readers look at this and say like, wow, look at Abraham, he's really a remarkable person. He's standing up for what's right, even against God. Leibovitch looks at this and says, oh, what a terrible person, a terrible religious person Abraham is. He misunderstands God entirely and thinks that God has to be Ethical. right and good. So according to Leibovitch, the Akedah is God's opportunity to teach Abraham once and for all that he, God, and, uh, and therefore Yerat Hashem, do not necessarily have to be right and good. 
And you might actually have to decide, do you follow God or do you want to be a good person? And the Akeda forced Avram to choose between those two. And when Avram chose to follow God, God says, right now I know that you actually fear God. Until now, I only knew that you happened to go along with me, but I was concerned that you might go along with me because I also happened to be uh, asking you to do things that were good. Now I know that you actually fear God, even when it's absolutely unethical. Um, uh, can, I, can I, I'm going to actually focus more maybe on Soloveitchik in this regard. Sure. Because Soloveitchik, of course, where he, where he was as a leader of modern orthodoxy, I see a lot of his writings as sort of trying to um, convince people that halacha is the correct way. And in an, er in an era in which people were trying to absorb maybe immigrants, American values, mm -hmm. and modern Western values, he was trying to convince people that, you know, you have to sometimes sacrifice for halacha, but that is the right thing to do. So do you think that what he was saying was just a philosophical statement or was it a sort of public policy statement that occasionally we need to hold our, let's call it our Western values at, at bay um, and just obey the call of halacha? You know, if I put in a, maybe a little bit, you know, it might not be fashionable to keep kashrut, right? It might not be fashionable to have a mechitza. It might not be fashionable to give up your career for Shabbat but sometimes you just got to listen to the divine call. Is, is that sort of in the line that Soloveitchik is going? Would you, do you see that as having a sort of social element that's driving his philosophy or is this pure philosophy? Uh, so I think, you know, I think part of the point here is that nothing's really pure philosophy. I mean, you know, a lot of these are philosophical views that do emerge because of, not necessarily that they're constructed in order to be public policy, but that they're certainly constructed in response to what the person perceives as the pressing issues of the day. That might be unconscious, but you know, I think Kierkegaard, you know, he looks at the Akeda and he sincerely sees this as a clash between faith and ethics because that's what's on his mind. Like, you know, that he's, he's worried by this. So he looks at the story, he's like, ah, this is a story about me. So in the, in the case of Rabbi Soloveitchik, it's actually, there's a couple of things to say. So one is that in his early writings, he doesn't talk about this whole like submitting to the inscrutable divine will uh, at all. And even in the, in the 1950s, we have a, a posthumous book uh, published, The Emergence of Ethical Man, which is actually one of the more remarkable books um, that's come out in the last, whatever, you know, 20 years or so, um, since the uh, Torah Sarav Foundation started publishing all these things posthumously. Uh, it's an unfinished book. And, you know, I think it's unfinished in a couple of senses, but, but there's a lot of like tension within the book. But he talks about Avraham in a totally different vein there. He talks about Avraham as someone who independently came up with a sense of what was right and then just happened to realize that that's what God wanted from him also. And he even says that the Akeda is not God commanding Avraham to offer Yitzchak. It was God inviting Avraham. He, he builds a lot on the kachna, like na meaning please. Like it would be nice if maybe you wanted to offer me your son. And Avraham's like, yes. That's exactly what I want to do. Because in this essay, he talked, you know, the Rav seems to think that, um, that Avram and God are, are like covenantal equals almost. Like they, they are literally walking on the same path. They just happen to agree about what the right things to do are in life. So, you know, and that's, that's in the 50s. Like the first few decades of his intellectual life, uh, he really doesn't get to this idea of like recoil, retreat, submit to the inscrutable God. But once you get to the 60s and 70s, he does. And it becomes like a major theme in his writing. I don't know why it suddenly pops up there. It may be that you're right. Maybe he just, uh, as he moves more into kind of a central leadership position in American orthodoxy, he realizes that this is what people are missing. Um, so he emphasizes it more. It may be, you know, as the Holocaust uh, seeped into public consciousness, that somehow that affected his, his sense of what we can and can't expect from God uh, and how we act. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis it, maybe internal Jewish politics, all sorts of things that I've like, you know, played with as possibilities. But I don't, I don't actually know why he starts in the '60s to say this. But you're absolutely right that from that point on, it's a theme that he hits on from every angle. That uh, it, and, and what he does actually with Kierkegaard is generalize it. So Kierkegaard talked about this as a one-time event, right? Once upon a time in his lifetime, Avram was asked to suspend ethics for the sake of faith, and the Rav says. This is actually the daily life of the halachic Jew. Like constantly, always, we are 
prepared to, and maybe actually in practice, suspending ethics for our halacha. And that could be like, you know, he has this scene that he comes back to all the time of like Chatan uh, um, and uh, Kala on the night of their, their wedding, and, and she's Pirsan Nidal, like she, she sees menstrual blood on the night of their wedding, and so they retreat. And he says, this is the heroic life of a halachic Jew. Like he and she have heroically recoiled, retreated because of halacha. So it becomes like this pervasive theme of putting aside everything else in life for the sake of halacha. And that, that goes like well beyond what Kierkegaard actually said. And when Kierkegaard would read this, he'd be like, okay, I sort of see myself like in the roots of this, but like clearly you've gone in a, uh, in a much more general direction than what I was saying uh, about the Akedah. So I don't really know biographically or socially why this becomes a big theme, but you're absolutely right that, that uh, for the last few decades of his, of his writing, uh, the Rav hits on this over and over, and he uses Akedah terminology. He right. even, uh, the last example, he even says that tefillah is fundamentally an Akedah experience. It's just like you bind I, yourself I, on the I, altar. When I was reading your analysis, I, uh, I was wondering whether as a result of this, you know, because it's, it's very interesting, you and me both belong to the modern Orthodox uh, community, and... Uh, one of the phenomena that people have spoken about in modern orthodoxy more recently is something that people call social orthodoxy. Um, that almost people follow the rules, but they're sort of, how should I say it? They're going through the motions and their heart or their spiritual consciousness isn't even in the game. Um, and I was wondering whether this, after you, your analysis of, of Rav Soloveitchik in this way, whether you know, I, I never particularly was attracted to the Leibovitz argument, but I, when you put them together in the same basket and, uh, and you put it in this way, I was wondering whether, you know, sort of what emerged out of this emphasis, this bifurcation between, on the one hand, ethics and halakha, putting yourself aside, and on the other hand, obeying the law, actually creates quite a sterile observance to the law, you know, and a generation hence, and we're actually, could it be that we're, we're maybe suffering from, a, from this division and from a situation where for many people, halakha just seems uh, almost technical, but the, the values aren't resonating with them. I had not thought of that. That sounds very insightful. Uh, I mean, it's, it's certainly true in, in, uh, in YU that the, the, the Rav's view of, of uh, the sort of later view that submissiveness and retreat and recoil are the key elements of a halakhic life, that that's become almost like uh, the gospel truth. You know, students say, you know, what, what's the one philosophical idea, need, uh, idea I need to know about Judaism? And, and there are like a non, number of uh, rabbinic faculty and others who have said, well, the most important thing you need to know is submission to the divine will, like even against uh, your ethical intuitions. Um, so that's a really, that's a really uh, like sort of scary, but really interesting suggestion you're making. Uh, what we see in YU is, is the, uh, I'm sure you see this to some extent, but kind of a, like, you know, it goes under the term neo Hasidut, um, which is almost the polar opposite, right? Like uh, we're not retreating from anything and we're gonna bring our whole selves into this religious being. And you know, forget, <laughs> forget Western values. Like I'm not sure they're, you know, I mean, you can, uh, you can talk about the Western values underlying this, but, um, but there's no clash because I just want to be entirely present and entirely uh, engaged in my religious life. And halakha is actually then uh, plays a much lesser role in, um, in that sort of portrait of what a religious life means. So I don't know, that's a really interesting idea. I, I don't know how to, how to sort of trace this sociologically or, or maybe just the ideas, but, but I think that's, very, that's a very attractive suggestion that like some of this actually does lead to where we are today. Well, let's go to some, I'll give you a chance to give some of your conclusions in the book, because you obviously take uh, Kierkegaard, Soloveitchik and Leibowitz to task, and you, you uh, raise certain, you know, troubling thoughts about all of this. So maybe you'd like to, because we don't have a huge amount of time, yeah. um, come to some <laughs> of your conclusions um, that you reach, and then we'll, we'll maybe try and right. evaluate some of those as well. Okay, sure. So, so briefly, uh, I'm not going to go through the whole the whole criticism, but yeah, I, I don't like uh, sort of Kierkegaard's view uh, for a bunch of different reasons, both textual reasons, like I don't think it's a good reading of the story, uh, and philosophically, I also think it's uh, sort of a remarkably Christian reading, um, and so it's sort of surprising to me that Jewish thinkers uh, were attracted to it. Um, and it's this idea that like the ideal religious figure is like alone on a mountaintop with God, like. 
it finds a great home in classical Christian thought, where the ideal religious figure is unmarried, you know, married to Christ and devoting their life to a solitary life in a monastery. Uh, but that's actually, you know, very, very rarely been the Jewish ideal of a religious figure. So there's all, all sorts of reasons why I don't like uh, Kierkegaard's view as a reading of that kid. I actually find it like a, a very stirring essay uh, as a religious person, but, um, but as a reading of that kid, I don't really like it. Uh, so the direction that I, that I try to argue it instead is to bring, well, I, the, the book is called Unbinding Isaac, because one of the things that I think is, is sort of uh, like almost comical for Warren's so terrifying uh, is that none of these thinkers talk about Yitzchak at all in the Akedah. Like he's just like, he's basically not there. Um, and that's sort of remarkable. Uh, and I think bringing Yitzchak back in also leads us to focus at least equally, and I think maybe even more so, on the second part of the story where the angel says, um, like, you know, Kierkegaard is entirely fixated on the first command. You know, go take your son and offer him a sacrifice. But of course, God then says, like, don't do that. And that seems like an important component to reading the story, the whole story, and say, okay, God said this, but then God said that. Like, how do we, how do we deal with both of these commands at the same time? So um, I try to argue that actually, uh, I don't know, I'm trying to think of how to do this in an abbreviated version, but say this, say this follows, uh, that actually the story is reflecting the complicated attitude that the, that God, let's say, in the story has towards uh, the idea of Avram offering Yitzchak as a sacrifice. Uh, that it's actually not easy, and this is where stories are very useful, it's not easy to say like God does or does not. Uh, because actually, like any like character, uh, God in the story both wants and doesn't want Avram to offer Yitzchak as a sacrifice. There's good reason for him to want that uh, sort of sacrifice. Um, child sacrifice is qualitatively more, uh, 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 qualitatively more impressive show of devotion than animal sacrifice. Basically because animal sacrifice could always be sort of like a, a bet for the future. Like I'm gonna give you a sheep God and hopefully next year I'll have more sheep. Um, but a child, like that doesn't make any sense. Like, if you're offering a child a sacrifice, this can only be a pure gift. Um, it's terrible, you know, it's a terrible idea to contemplate, but it's a, it's a pure gift. So God might say like, oh, that's great. Like, that's the kind of gift I want. I never get pure gifts from people. Whenever anyone gives me a, you know, wheat or matzah or a sheep, like, I always know that they just want more from me next year. So like the idea of a pure gift is something very attractive to God as God. But and for that reason, there's something actually positive about child sacrifice, or at least attractive about child sacrifice. But, they are, but they, what I argue is that there's actually an even more important reason why God doesn't want child sacrifice. And that's that child sacrifice runs up against the idea of Yitzchak being an independent person. So I can offer my sheep as a korban because the sheep is mine. I own it, like it's my property. Like, you know, I don't know, PETA people might not like me saying this, but like, uh, I think it was, you know, it was an economic reality and there's a, there's a spiritual reality to that. Like this is, there's, there's a, uh, the relationship between the sheep and, and me is not one of equals. But the relationship between a father and a son in this story, Avram and Yitzchak, may not be one of equals in terms of the family structure, but God might look at it and say, ah, but vis-a-vis -vis me, you are equals. And once that's true, and I argue that that's something that Tanakh actually makes a big deal about, but once that's true, of course, it makes no sense for Avram to offer Yitzchak as a korban. That's just like, offer, like one person offering their neighbor as a korban. You have no right to do that. Like I, I might appreciate the, the intention, but like that's just murder. You can't do that. And so God says, as much as I would like child sacrifice because I like the devotion that it reflects, I can't have child sacrifice because it absolutely violates the independent value of Yitzchak as his own covenantal partner, his own Obed Hashem. And so like it's just off the table. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll stop there. That's, that's the crux. I, I, when, I, when I saw your reading, it very much reminded me of uh, Uriel Simon's um, literary reading of, of the Akedah, because what he does is he pits the different Hinanis one against each other. One Hineni which Avram says to God, and one Hineni which, Av which uh, Avram says to his son. Obviously, there's a third Hineni which he says to God, <laughs> but ultimately, I don't think one can escape the fact that at the end of the story, we, we, we emerge with the feeling 
that obviously God does not want the sacrifice. God doesn't want us to kill our children. <laughs> it's not what God wants. Right. Uh, right. I mean, so I, I very much appreciate that you say it's obvious. Um, I say that Rabbi Soloveitchik, in one of his later writings, when he's in his submission mode, uh, actually says that the reason that God didn't ask Avram to actually kill Yitzchak is because he was already dead in his heart. Like, it was, yeah. it was, there was just no point in killing him at that point. Like, Avram had to give up Yitzchak. So because he successfully emotionally gave up Yitzchak, there was no point in actually spilling blood. But I, I mean, I, so that's why I say that to say like, well, not everyone thinks it's so obvious, <laughs> but I, I very much agree with you. I think that, that, uh, that don't, you know, no, that's actually a high point. And in different ways, actually, a number of commentators have said this. The Malbim says that like, that's the hardest part of this Nisayon. Like once Avraham had gotten himself ready to actually offer a korban, the fact that God then said, don't do it. Like, I don't even know what it takes to pivot like that. But Avraham was able to do that. And you know that that part is uh, is what we are most supposed to learn something from. Uh, and I also like this quote from Levinas that I uh, end the book with. Uh, Levinas says something like um, that Abraham was able to to obey the first command is astonishing, but the essential part is that he had he was able to obey the second command, and that's that's really the the high point of the story. Um, so um, I, you know, I agree with you, but not everyone. <laughs> so let me just take this a, a one last stage because uh, last year you penned a op-ed in one of the YU newspapers uh, on the topic of LGBT and uh, you actually use the Akedah and your, to a certain degree, the conclusions that you bring here uh, in a sort of call for people to um, give more, uh, you, you, you even sort of insinuated from this point that we have no right to sacrifice other people on the altar of, uh, of Judaism and to, it's one thing what a person chooses to do to themselves, but to choose to take somebody else and uh, so to speak, to kill them, to, to avoid them of all of their uh, life force is not for us to do. And in fact, uh, you, you drew this from the Arcada. Um, so I, I was just really interested to see whether, what sort, first of all, to hear from you, what sort of reactions you got from different groups within Yeshiva University, because I know Yeshiva University has been in the news for all of this. And this seems to flow sort of quite organically from what you've been saying. And, and you know, did this, did this come out of your analysis in this book? How does this sort of uh, flow from what you're saying? Uh, yeah, so before I, before I say anything about that specifically, um, I don't know if you've seen this, but we, I, I just had a hand in this project um, called the Akeda Project, uh, which is online, like just went up last week, akedaproject.com. Uh, it's I've watched amazing. Some of, I've watched some of the pieces, very powerful. Yeah, so some of the most powerful videos are actually people talking about their personal Akedah experiences where they feel either that they've been asked to sacrifice their child, not physically, thank God, um, but uh, socially or familially, uh, or that they feel like they've been sacrificed um, by the community or by their parents for something. So the Akedah really does resonate in personal ways in uh, for lots of people, I and mean, usually this is painful. You know, it's a, it's not a story that a lot of people take solace in these days. It used to be that that, that was more true. Uh, in Israel, this is true. You know, there's this whole genre of uh, akedah, uh, oh, like, sort of invoking akedah, and yeah, in military context. So, but anyway, um, but I'll, I'll just encourage people to go to that akedahproject.com because it's, it's amazing. I mean, the, the personal videos are the ones that are most poignant. They really do say deep things. Um, the so I would say as follows, the, the, my work on the Akedah didn't so much uh, give me something to say about that issue as much as give me a vocabulary for it. Um, and it's because I was steeped in the Akedah at the time, uh, that was the lens through which I saw it. Um, but I actually wasn't advocating any particular policy. What I was advocating against is a rhetoric that I think people adopt far too readily that says, you know, because I'm very pious, you have to suffer. And it may be that that's unavoidable at some point. Like, I, I don't want to say that that's not possible. It's entirely possible that that's an unavoidable conclusion for someone uh, who takes their faith seriously and, and takes Holocaust seriously. Um, but I think people often don't realize just how troubling it is for you to say, like, because I am pious, you have to suffer. Because as you said, it's, you know, it's entirely for people to decide that they will suffer for their piety. 
Uh, but it seems like we should at least be incredibly careful and in checking ourselves a thousand times before we condemn someone else to suffering because of what we're pretty sure is our own piety. So again, it's not to say that there's a particular view or policy that I think is the right one. Um, I just, I hear too quickly, you know, I don't, I don't think this is a YU specific thing, but certainly on my campus, when we had a campus, um, we, uh, we heard too quickly, people like willing to say like almost glibly like yeah i know i you know i would love to but unfortunately like i can't and like i can't you know i'm gonna i, I unfortunately have to quash my ethics here because of halacha but of course quash my ethics makes it sound like it's self-sacrifice like look what i'm doing look how good i am i'm quashing my ethics but actually what you're doing is saying i'm gonna be fine your life unfortunately is going to be hell because of my piety so again um maybe the policy is unavoidable I mean, it's, I, i'm not a public policy person and it's a it's a tough issue but the rhetoric of, of uh, one person's piety leading to another person's suffering, I think is something that should at least sort of put our, put our antenna up and be like, okay, like let's think very, very carefully if there's some way out of this, because this seems like a troubling position to take, a troubling tack to, uh, to take on uh, an issue. So that was, that was my argument uh, in, the, in the piece, but um, you know, reactions are you know, pretty predictable, like, I don't know. Uh, there's nothing that I would say that would that would surprise you here. Like, <laughs> you know, those who you'd expect to be happy were happy. Those who you'd expect to be annoyed were annoyed. And I don't know. <laughs> it wasn't. I, the, the the real reason I wrote anything at all was for the students because, um, you know, it started with a student group that was advocating, essentially for recognition as LGBTQ, which is tough. Again, I'm not saying that this is a simple thing for YU to swallow as an Orthodox campus. Um, but I wanted it to be clear that this was not a case, this is not like the students and then there's no one on the faculty who even hears them, who recognizes them as human beings. I wanted it to be as a matter of record, like here's a faculty member in Jewish studies who at least says like, look, like I'm, I'm with you emotionally. You know, I'm, I don't have a policy. I can't offer you anything. I can't change anything, but, um, but at least emotionally, like I see you and I'm with you. I think our time is up. I would love to talk to you for longer, but I think our time is up. Um, and this is meant to be our hour long session. So first of all, I'll say it's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure yes. to engage in conversation. It really has been. Thank you and so much. And to hear you. And uh, I want to encourage everybody to go check out the book, uh, Unbinding Isaac. And I, I will say that as opposed to I, when I approached the book, I was very intimidated. I thought it'd be exceedingly long and, and difficult to read. <laughs> but it's not long <laughs> and it isn't <laughs> difficult to read. There are a couple of segments in the book which get a little heavy philosophically, but beyond those, it's an, it's, it's an easy read and it's a stimulating read and it's thoughtful. And I think you'll really enjoy reading it, uh, whoever's uh, going to be listening to this. So I want to encourage you to engage with the book. And uh, I thank you, uh, Dr. Kohler, for writing it because it's an important contribution to a, a to text which actually is incredible um, how on the one hand, well, I mean, I think it's one of the major accolades that we can say about the Tanakh, that in, in about 20 Psukim, you can tell a story which has engaged people's minds and souls in such a fierce way uh, for millennia. Um, I encounter this every single Rosh Hashanah where my wife comes back after reading the Akedah in such a state that we are ever was banned talking about the Akedah in my house. <laughs> because it's such a fraught emotional moment for her every year. And, um, and it's not bad enough that we have to experience it on Rosh Hashanah, but we have to experience it Parsha Bayera as well, and then get back into the conversation. So um, it, it's quite something that the Torah, this text in the Torah, which engages our, uh, really our souls, our minds, and our ethics in this way. So thank you for writing the book, and thank you for making the time to be with us today. And I wish you and all of our listeners a Shana Tova. And indeed, that uh, we should, the ma'achelet should be indeed, and we should uh, really experience that reversal from a, from a threatening situation to a life giving situation in our current realities. Amen. Amen. And thank you so much. This is great. Thank you very much.